Hello, and welcome to the 44th Radical Poetry Reading. I'm Malvika Jolly, Special Projects Associate here at The Rail. Uh, today I have the pleasure of welcoming poet, memoirist, and literary chronicler, as well as editor Neely Tchaikovsky, who has curated a fantastic lineup of poets and readers for us today, featuring Seth Amos, Aggie Falk, Kyle Harvey, and Danny Rosen, uh, who are tuning in today together from Lithic Bookstore in Fruta, Colorado. Finally, we've started out all our events here with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we're on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and of the Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. And I think it's worth saying that the heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all those who struggle for freedom in recognition uh, that when it comes to our liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation. In that spirit, I encourage you all to check out the chat for a living document of resources and actions we've been putting together behind the scenes at the rail. Um, but we'll get right into it. Uh, it's now my honor uh, to welcome our wonderful curator, Neely Tchaikovsky. He's a poet, memoirist, uh, and so, so much more. And his latest books of poetry, Hang on the Yahtzee River, an elegy for my beat generation, came out with Lithic Press in 2018 and 2020, respectively. He's the biographer of Charles Bukowski and Lawrence Ferlinghetti. And just last week, he shared stories and verses with all of us here today uh, on you know, our tribute to Lawrence Ferlinghetti, which I definitely recommend you check out if you're interested in that kind of thing, countercultural history and poetic lineage. Um, he's the recipient of an American Book Award and the Josephine Miles Penn Award tuning in from his studio in San Francisco. Uh, Neely, take it away. And Neely, I'll invite you to turn on your microphone. Neely, I'll, I'll invite you to turn on your microphone if you want to sort of click accept. Thank you Perfect. so much. There, we're on. We're on. OK. Uh, I'm going to begin with a poem I wrote uh, uh, at 4 a.m. because I couldn't sleep and, and uh, in praise of the golden eternity for Jack Kerouac. There's a great, great poem called The Scripture of the Golden Eternity that Kerouac wrote. And it was really a crucial book for me, uh, text, small chapbook when I was young. We find starvation where abundance reigns. A dizzy reality sets in. Yes, we walk with St. Francis and talk to Lao Tzu. It appears that Kerouac died drinking himself to death. We go on about the business of ceremonial poesy. This is all we own. This is all we need. This wealth of invisibility twinkling across starlit fields, we soar in the trail of hawks, forever devoted to sheets of rain, making green grass speak. We speak to the dawn across golden fields. Hello, rusted nail of old campfires. Good morning, Rambo. We give you a Nobel Prize in medicine. Say your prayers in the road, one foot forward until you understand the golden eternity as a secret traveler's end of land where sea mammals stand guard until we destroy them because of our power. Yet we hold a red candle as the headways race towards spring, the eternity of a golden secret wise in your palm, crazier and crazier, the air traces it with nimble fingers, the insanity of a silver lining, a golden bowl sways in awkward patience. Do not be worried. Go directly to the animal who grazes on snow-crusted grass above bewildered multitudes. Praise every moment a vast practice of devotion and solitude. 
The silence of our golden infirmity makes us richer in the end. Poor Jack, rich Jack, every man's Jack. Jack be simple forever. The blues, Jack of all trades, Jews and bitter roots, truth, bamboo shoots on haiku islands where the child wanders through endless night. Eternity dies in golden dust on mineral rich ridges of the monument. It's very humorous how you pay to visit a trail that leads you, choose a mountain of the Lord, this one who gave to the prophet the gift of language, the silence necessary to join the choir of the eternal sound. Whale watching. So this is a couple of weeks old and uh, are we doing fine on time? We're doing great on time. We went out to see the whales. It's only a 10 minute drive to Pacifica. We drive along the highway only a few short miles to find humpback whales heading for the casinos. Legendary, hunted to near extinction, proud sea mammals. They once fueled our lamps. Are they not forever haunted by cloud and ample sea spirit? They have spouts and keen eyes. We buy pastrami grinders and walk on shallow shore. I refuse to lend an ear to the voice of deceit. Time now to hear only my own difficult breathing. This shortness of breath takes time. One must adjust the clock, trim excessive noise from the poet and philosopher, try to walk at the end of Manor Drive for the whales. They don't appear on as monolithic as you might think. No, they are not performers. They are going to be momentary and from the cliff might appear to be seabirds. So don't be excited. Go quietly into your ideas. Go pick a cloud. Take one deep breath. Ask the inventory clerk if the whale will surface for a few seconds or even half a minute. Take another breath. Hold on to the railing. Try standing upright. Listen for the ocean as you feel gulls in formation looking for food. Be patient. Open your fist wide for the cold silence. Mind the sea. Learn how to control your breathing and your bleeding light. Okay, now the last poem is one of the old ones called I See. It's a very short poem in 1961, believe it or not. I see this as a bad sign, this coming hour. Here in our crippled land of abandoned vineyards, I hear common violence entering the fray. So much to do. So much envy, twisted vines, rude clouds. I hope the world will shut up long enough for me to complete a few simple chords on the steam calliope. Thank you. Now, all right, I introduce Agneta Falk a really fantastic Swedish-born poet who lived many years in Great Britain uh, and has lived in San Francisco for the last few decades with the poet Jack Hirschman. She and I have read together in Modena de Garda, Italy, in uh, a little town of Hall outside of Innsbruck, Austria. 
I've waited for her at the train station in Venice and all that sort of thing. And uh, she's a great international figure, uh, beloved poet in our city, Agneta. Aggie, um, I'm going to invite you to turn on your microphone and you should be able to press OK. Yeah, thank you, Neely. Please give me the hope if I go over time. Please just say you are going over time because I haven't timed myself. The first poem I'm reading is a dedication to two dear friends, David Patrick and Duncan. And it's with pride I read it in the times of pride. Playing the Margoni. That night you put on the Margoni, we danced till dawn without speaking. You with full blown aids kept a tight secret and he young without knowledge of it, bursting with love and passion for you. And I a mere pawn in a game, I didn't then quite understand, but willing, oh so willing, to weave my body into this story unfolding in the deep midwinter night in that small room between the canal and the road. How my role was to hold you apart without knowing why, while your hearts and bodies pounded through me like express trains in the night. Eyes full of longing, deep thrusting glances, each moment tearing at the unsayable, the forbidden. Oh, moon of Alabama, we now must say goodbye, sings Jenny. The night is on its knees and the needle sticks yet again on the gramophone. We begin again closer to the core, a muffled hurricane moving toward Madoni. And here you come, dressed as a judge, wagging your finger. He down on the floor, begging. This naked denial needs dressing up. In the deepest water, we bury the living before they die. In the early hours, I'm the last divider, the membrane between you two. As you both begin to dig into my arms, as if they belong to either one of you. The thoughts among us unspoken. Mm. In days to come, we hum the Magoni and burst into intimate giggles at the thought. Months later, David Patrick took his last breath. A couple of more months later, after reportedly missing for a week, Duncan's body was found in the canal. We must have whiskey, or you know why. So that's that one. The second one, I'm just picking wildly, is, uh, I don't have to tell you, it's called Dang Dang. Talking about you and Mary, spinning words on barricades, dropping them in our laps, perfect time bombs of tears and laughter, blowing us off seats of inertia. D, 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 writing about the view from the bottom of the heap, putting faces in places not known on the map, making them sing, skip, scream, do, 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 do. Who writes, who, 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 who? Cross drafts of who's and why's, telling you not to tell truth to liars. Dang, dang, dang. Oh, that mercurial intellect, moving heart and bone and thought on stilts through this myriad confusion of race, power and class, blowing holes in the semantic ritual. Dang, dang, dang. Oh, sweet thunder, who wag, who never tired of making noises. And Mary Barak, God, the blessed one anchored to this earth. Your words will never die. Dang, 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 dang. Homecoming. I hear you walking up the steps, your bag hitting the metal railing. 
the key searching for the lock in the door. You are home and the house is warm again. Some days I don't hear you at all. You just appear as from nowhere, the black hat obscuring your eyes and it's time to turn the heating on. Either way, there is no distance between you coming and going. And if there's a draft in my feelings, it's because I left the door open all day. Somewhere near the ice. The wind brought me here into a hidden corner on a rocky beach. Something about the light, the sky and sea melting into one, into me. The pounding waves sound like I look inside. And there she is, my mother. And all the mothers before her, dancing on a ring of breath, becoming my breath. And nothing can stop me now from mm. releasing the torrent of tears for all those who have passed and those wandering over the earth in search of a new home where bombs don't fall. And then I'm going to, because you all were friends with David Melzer, I want to read this poem to David Melzer too. How am I doing for time? Am I all right? Am I all right for time? Yes, Thank you're perfect. You have about four minutes. With David Melzer. Dear David, I lost the poem I wrote you many years ago, the only copy I had of Dancing Syllables. The day after you died, I read it at the first day celebration. I must have put it on the table and somehow it got trampled up with the rest of that shitty year. Ever since, I can't stop thinking about it, trying to remember some of the lines but all I end up with is a long empty corridor with closed doors, just like the feeling I have of you no longer being here in person. I just know that behind those doors lie the gift you left, the memories of you dancing those syllables, those words, clinking them together so smoothly, so roughly, melodiously in and out of sync, just like that fat Cossack you slim down in your poems before you re release them so elegantly, wittily, a solo trumpeter in the night. And that mischievous smile of yours, making light out of darkness, bending your ear to the silliest thing, turning them on their head, putting it in its place off beat to the point, giggling out of every corner of your brain, tossing the whole goddamn idiocy of this and that conundrum of life's little foibles, turning them into gems. The doors in that corridor begins to open. There is so much light coming through the tree of life, and the bird on every branch singing your songs. And through it all, your eyes, those eyes, as always, smiling. And then the last one. Mm. And it's for my granddaughter, Isabella. Isabella Rose. Isabella for Isabella Rose. And there she is, the twinkle in my eye. In her palm lies my future. I follow her commands, not even pretending I have a will of my own. She looks right through me with big brown eyes. So far, I can almost touch my great great grandmother's hair. Uh, her dreams play in the sun, and when it rains, I turn my umbrella upside down so I don't miss a drop of a gorgeous laughter. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right. So the next reader, um, I, I I sort of call him my uh, in my head. I, I think of him as like a spiritual grandson. I mean, for God's sake, I'm decades older than Seth Amos. Um, I was sitting with my partner at dinner one night and I had a copy of Lunch Poems by Frank O'Hara on the table. And he was the waiter and Seth came up and said, are you a poet? I said, yes, I am. And well, anyway, it ended so four days later, we had uh, lunch. So Lunch Poems for dinner, that was great. And I, and I meet this fantastic poet who ends up uh, now living in Brooklyn. He was on the staff of Lapham's Quarterly uh, at one point, he's had poems in in um, many print and, and online journals, uh, is working on a book of poems. Um, and so it's really my great pleasure to introduce Seth Amos. Thank you, Neely. Uh, thank you, Malvika, and everyone at the Brooklyn Rail uh, for having me. It's an honor. And uh, if you were in my section the night that I met Neely. I'm sorry for ignoring you. Uh, all right, uh, first poem I'm going to read is called Don't Get Weird. Uh, this is a line taken from a conversation with my parents when I told them that I wanted to be a poet. Don't get weird. Don't lose yourself or forget your appearance. Don't walk around muttering soliloquies or let your daily bread be the prayers of the dead. That's not food on the table. We think it's great that you can recite poems. Just don't do it to yourself. We've heard you in your room. Don't do it in public either. We are so proud of you for writing little poems with fine pens on good paper, but let that be it. Isn't paper enough? Then there's the drink. We know the perils of diving headfirst into yourself. You get thirsty. We know you have heroes and that they enjoyed a tipple or two. Just don't get weird. Don't drink alone. Don't get drunk. If you get lonely, don't turn to women. Don't turn to men either. Keep reasonable company. Don't make weird friends. Most of your friends are dead. That's fine. Jesus died for you. The truth is, we worry about you. You spend most of your time alone with friends you cannot meet. That's fine. Just remember, Jesus came out of his room and he never wrote anything down. Well, except for that little bit in the sand, and we're not sure you can call that published. We are just so proud of you, our son, the poet. You don't see many these days. Just out of curiosity, where do you think it will lead you? No matter, you're happy. You are happy, right? We have a hard time telling. Honestly, we just don't know what to do with all of this, but we are so very proud of you. If you ever run out of paper or ink, just let us know. And here is me not taking their advice. Um, during the, the, uh, the, the lockdown and everything, amongst other realizations, uh, I realized the importance of the unencumbered uh, imagination and uh, as a sort of type of mental health. So the uh, epigraph for this is from Joyce's Ulysses and it is thought as the thought of thought. And the poem is entitled The Cocktail Party. Come for sip sip. Nothing needs dunning. We're all friends here. Think, think, thinks, thinking thinks for itself. The shepherd of moments, the mind tracing its folds. Well, might, 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 if would, would, would. Don't tell them, you know. Lilac to no one said, the blooms are late in the eyelids, then poured Manhattan in the cat's ear. Seer Otis, well wet, interjected. Leaking is the am vessel I empty, meant. The empty vessel I am is leaking. Gaspancho, young in the tooth, said, but why do we like ice and heat? And then laughed at a dog fart. Betty Stranger, to the unattended corner, whispered, safety in numbers, danger in words. 5891462132 to the tenth power. Old Orpheus, strong with the gift, found Lot's salty wife and licked her and decided Eurydice must be pepper. Have you tried the skin syrup, sweet as bread and lamb's blood? And was Jesus his own favorite food? Um, and the next one is 
called from wild things who require spectacle. First part, one. In a wood once, I saw death feed thousands. Nothing asked what took the life from it. Any wild thing knows old age is luxury, a kind of hunger in another mouth. I could not make out the dish. The meal had already started, flayed open by teeth and talons, larvae laid upon it like offerings that consume their altar. Full mouths contemplated the gift while fitful unfeeling eyes kept watch. They buried it in their bellies, the quiet of sustenance, their eulogies. Two, in the bar at 6 a.m., the painter, new in town, sat disappointed with the calm. Isn't this where the poets drink? Her beer full, her eyes half closed. She wanted spontaneous recitations for the mayhem of our minds to boil beautiful, to manifest what we were working toward instead of seeking solace from. I jumped on the tabletop, tore my clothes, kicked off the dice and cash, cut my face with fingernails, inhaled a lung full of silence, and saw she had fallen asleep. Three. The whale chose the water because it wanted to forget its weight. It carries the secret of its breath until it must leap and let out and take in what no fish knows. Four. As though the fire had, a fire had already said everything, we sat silent, wrapped in listening, and it lulled us into stupor, the serpent charming its creator. We listened to its million forked tongues in violent light, hoping our pregnant gaze would deliver to us anything we could consume. Uh, and just a few more for you guys if I have time. The next one uh, is for my father. It's called Cannonball. He's already midair, midfall when I look up, my legs still dangling in the water. I had heard his feet slap the pockmarked concrete, then nothing. Moments ago, he was sitting in the shade, his body stiff with tremor, repeating to himself the word the doctors repeated, Parkinson's. He's just above the water, lithe, almost weightless, Knees clutched to his chest, ankles crossed. He's ammunition now, aimed at the water's heart. He breaks its skin, a direct hit. The splash falls back into itself, a resounding applause. The water tries to heal with him still inside. He surfaces, howling at the cold. And two more. Um, I was walking down the other day, I was walking uh, through bed where I live, and on the corner was a young man shadow boxing, and I wrote this when I got home. Boy with fists. The day staggers. With a blow, he wounds the air. Drawing back, he sutures it. He is not afraid of the unseen. Undaunted, he jabs and hooks. He bobs and weaves. He anticipates the invisible's return. His feet are lithe and set. He can't be knocked down, but he can dance. He must. He doesn't trust the air not to sucker punch him. He guards his cheek. It has happened before. The air is sweating. It's wearing down. His fists pass through the humidity, dry at first. Then the battering beads the air's blood on his skin. He will finish it. He knows the air has a weak side. He's punching above his weight into weightlessness. He punches to tenderize, to pulverize, to make from the air a poultice to heal his few former days. He beats its tongue down its throat. He takes its teeth as talisman. And my last one, and thank you guys for listening. To my little sister in a time of crisis. Do you remember when life was a long house with a hill beside it? when a piece of cardboard and a push made us happy, when the only struggle we knew was running out of cardboard and rolling our bodies down the hill instead. Do you remember the pine trees? Sometimes I can smell the grass and feel it tickling my neck. Can you? Did I tell you that once I took a baseball bat to that giant pine that overlooked our hill? I struck it first in the bat's sweet spot 
and it recoiled like dad's shotgun. Blow after blow, I hit that great tree. Flecks of bark flew like shrapnel. My precise blows created a head-sized opening. The pale wet wood leaked heavy sap. I examined my bat, caked with the stuff. What had I done? Ruined my bat, ruined the tree. I tried to wipe it off, but it clung to the aluminum. It clung to my hand. Together, we wore the tree's wound, and I wept. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you, Seth. So uh, <clears throat> I'd like to just say, before I introduce Kyle, what a beautiful arc, A-R-K, the Brooklyn Rail is in, in the city of Walt Whitman. And uh, I've been so happy to be a part of it in several different ways now. This is the latest manifestation of my relationship with this wonderful arc, this ship. Uh, Seth reminds me of a, of a line I just have to read from Ezra Pound uh, at the end of a canto, in meine Heimat, in my own country, where the dead walked and the living were made of cardboard. Now I recite that when you think of the state of the nation. And I think Pound who wrote that in the fifties really predates what's, what's going on today. And again, thank you for the rail for its great, uh, inexpressibly wonderful and open-hearted forum. Now Kyle Harvey is a great poet. And he has a book coming out from Kanea Forum Press in Austin, Texas. And um, he's a member of the city council of Fruta, Colorado, where Lithic Press is. He has three children. Um, he's a poet, book designer, musician, all these multi-talented things. Um, he's a great introduction writer, I can tell you. And, um, and, and I take it personally because he's also my literary executor. So when I'm gone, it's, it's, all, uh, it's all in his hands. Uh, Kyle. Thank you, Neely. I appreciate that. I love you. Um, also, Malvika, I really appreciated your words about uh, native lands there in, in New York. And I just wanted to also acknowledge that here at Lithic Bookstore in Fruta, Colorado, um, I wanted to acknowledge that we're on Ute land. Um, I'm gonna read some poems from uh, my forthcoming collection, Cosmographies. This is the Alf Alphabet's Book of Early Thought. The early thought, the shape of light gathered, thrown on the object of July's affection, thrown on the secrets of water, the secrets of birds, secrets of flowers. The early thought, the shape of light gathered, thrown on the alphabet's unfoldment in the secret of darkness. The early thought, the shape of light gathered, thrown on yourself in the mirror, shown through a cluster of crystals on the counter. Do not lie blame on me for a lack of meaning. Do not lie blame on me for for more thinking and less talking. Do not lie blame on me for growing further away in a field full of oceans. The world before man always expanding beyond the first penalty of pride. Might you join me in wrapping our linen thoughts around what will always be empty, if not for our shared reality and the gathered light. The early thought, the shape of light gathered, thrown towards the process of immediate things. Hostile rivers flood, blood on the bottom of feet from a thorn. But what moon, what sun, what stars? The early thought, the shape of light gathered and then shared. What must be said of the gathering light? What must be said of the gathering light? What must be said of the gathering light? Continued until a man with a hole in his hat stands behind the pulpit and raises his hand. Of light we spoke and gathered in and gathered such as it does when laid upon darkness, pitied there all the night for a thousand years, one season. Of light we spoke and gathered in, descended from what heavens. Of light we spoke and gathered in and around an inward fire. 
We of light as all does shine when out from under cover. We of light as all does shine the bee as does the clover. We of light as all does shine the glow upon the meadow. We of light and gathered such and spoke thereof in spite of all our sorrows. We of light the gathered dust and visions of Johanna. We of light are true enough. We are true enough. July is true enough. The morphic field true enough. Emerging form true enough. The color of night true enough. Divine imagination true enough. Energy man, it's true enough. The principle of change, a will to change, a language inside of a language, a field within a field, existing habits are true enough. New patterns are true enough. Inherent memory is true enough. Our origin is true enough. The cosmos spilling from an egg is true enough. The big bang and the clapping of hands is true enough. The myth of reality projected towards one another in the gathering light is true enough. Yeah. Jack Alice comma and her chalice comma are true enough. In fact, they have found their way into my poem palace. 1987 and the death of the last dusky seaside sparrow is true enough and the world imagined is true enough. It's true enough there are no straight lines and it's true enough there are many straight lines. Truth is the color of teeth is true enough. Shit happens is true enough. Mathematics is true enough. Metaphors are true enough. N -n -n Nature's imperfect stutter is true enough. I, 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 no, not I, but nature is true enough. Uh. All is holy is true enough. The first poem is what I say to you and what you say to me. The first poem is true enough. The first poem becomes the last, the first mm -hmm. poem. Right, right. This is, a. Uh, the next one is, um, Western sweep for all of life's mysteries uh, with, a, with a line from a friend, John Landry, and also with an epigraph from our friend, Jack Mueller. Stay solid in the mystery. Jack, I don't know what to say. Time was not time and mind was not. Light was not, nor darkness. My dreams haven't always been wrong, Jack. It was 4.32 a.m. and the creek was rising. The bridge was washed out, Jack, and it was mostly silent, if not for the faint cries of the saints and the fays and their cries. And Jack, we were sitting in your car and your car wouldn't start. It started to snow. We were cold and you suggested we rub two words together until they make fire. Jack, I don't know what to say. Silence is my mother tongue, Jack, and song my second language. Lorca was my grandmother, and his mother's mother was the song itself. The song itself was something else, a river, a lover, the myth of whatever. What I wouldn't do to die for forever, wrap myself in the light of a feather, warp myself into the good of my father. He once left me in the woods, Jack. What is the color of night, Jack? Please don't tell me, Bible Black. I've passed over Celia through the dark halls of, mo of a mollusk. At the top of the stairs, there were more stairs. and the top of those stairs, there are more stairs. Cecilia, you're breaking my heart. You're shaking my confidence daily. Daily, I am born again, disoriented into domestica. Always at the top of the stairs, there are more stairs. Nerval always winds his tight spiral, fevers his way into extraordinary magnitudes obsessively loves his way. Jack, I don't know what to say. Yesterday, with, there was an ocean. Now it's gone. Every house is filled with years and every year filled with sadness. We light no small fire to keep our pipes from freezing. We sing no insignificant song to keep our hearts thawed. Let me fall asleep in this poem. Let me awake from this dream and in, into another. And uh, I'm just going to read one more. Um, this is a little bit shorter one from a section in the book called The Western Suites. And uh, this is Western Suite for nothing in particular after Bill Brookson. 
Even as the evening light lies golden upon us, there is a despair in the air for nothing in particular and for all things, but we must not say so. Though I want for nothing in particular, I find myself unfulfilled and unsettled, full of uncertainties and desperate leaps of imagination. It's 12.46 p.m. on a Wednesday afternoon. I've written a few good lines for nothing in particular and for which no one will care, nor will I. It's 12.48 p.m. on a Wednesday afternoon, and it doesn't matter who I am or for what winds blow, sand in Devil's Canyon, and for nothing in particular. It's 1.39 p.m., and a black hole just ripped through me, and now stars leak from my veins. My cosmos aches for nothing in particular. Still, an ache is an ache is an ache. I don't want to stay, and I don't want to go. What hasn't changed is my will to be estranged. Thank you guys very much. It's been wonderful hearing you all. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Now, uh, <clears throat> the next gentleman I'll introduce is the founder of Lithic Press Bookstore and Publishing House, right there in tr the tradition of Lawrence Ferlinghetti. I'm, I'm in, right now, I'm revising my Ferlinghetti book that, believe it or not, I wrote in 1979. And now it's being revised and it'll come out soon. But at any rate, this poet, I'll never forget the day when he said to me, I want to publish a book of yours. And I was so excited. And unfortunately for him, he's had to listen almost 350 days of the year to a poem of mine on the telephone. As I call him up, I'm either lonely or uh, uh, upset over something. And I got to call uh, my man up. And uh, uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, so, He's such an incredible poet as well as, uh, I mean, imagine a little town of 14,000 people, you go in and there's all these poetry books, a blizzard of them, and books on indigenous people and books of the environment. And uh, Danny Rosen, he's a geologist, he's an astronomer, there's, you, can, you can look at the rings of Saturn um, uh, at the observatory at his place. He lives about five miles out of town and on the way to his place, you can stop at a house and, and, and this old woman opens the garage and there's thousands of tomatoes and you can pick, like he did, five pounds of the most incredible luscious tomatoes. And then you go to his place and he opens the door and the first thing out of the door of the car is Zorro, the dog who I'm sure is at his feet right now. This is my beloved publisher, fellow poet, Danny Rosen. Thank you, Neely. Thanks, Malvika. Like Kyle said, it's great to, to be here with all of you, listening to all of you. And after Neely's wonderful introduction, what can I do but read a page from a <clears throat> poem I wrote a couple of years ago when Neely and I, along with uh, his partner, Jesse, and our friend, Paul Vangelisti, spent some time in in Italy, and uh, this is from the Tuscan journals. I'll just read the last page. The wise man is a fool on Tuesdays. The confidence man is meticulous in his casual dress. The German bikers wear shark skin leggings to ride with green urgency up and down the hills to Gabriella and Luciano's house where Neely does Ferlinghetti at the terrace table. Jesse is laughing. Malatesta is in the air. Now Neely does pound as if he too was in the halls of hell. Vangelisti says, my writing is all about process. Then I take the process out of it. Someone else says Pasolini would be there with the cops beating up Ginsburg. Someone says Formagini is still falling. Someone says the poem is about jumping to the next or about itself 
or about a midnight visit to Shelley's house by the bay where gulls mew and mock the poets who argue academic feathers and woo, woo, woo their sexual natures. Or it's about the precision of a thin slice, the way she caught each piece off a large cylinder of prosciutto took my breath away. Then came a London mule, talk of Ishii, last of his tribe, and Neely said, bullet train, apropos of absolutely nothing but another quiet morning at Il Forno Cafe, where we love life so much that sometimes we want to kill. Neely Tchaikovsky has been killed so many times and still here he is, an old world man. If any man is an old world man, he has lived in this land for 400 years. He comes from a long line of notaries. He knows nothing of the notary. He comes from a long line of builders. He has never built anything with anything but words. He is a man of words. He is an Italian film star from the very beginning of the talkies, sad eyes made for the big screen. He is on the phone with Ezra's daughter, a child jolly swinging his legs, leaning back, doing Bukowski. Jesse is laughing. Oh, Daniel, dear, Neely sighs and says, as Hank, this is the gift, and I am ill with it. Cheers, Neely. <laughs> well, it seems like uh, so many people uh, who are participating here are on the coast or New Orleans or in some big urban area where I'm from. I'm from Philly, which I left about 40 years ago. And uh, I saw I'd do a couple of things from the neighborhood. This is called uh, Flew Off an Eagle. Turning west on the way to 16, the book cliffs loom above the soft, dried sea. The Cretaceous beach, now slowly receding tough rock, loses to the sun in a red verb spasm. Two ravens squawk, float tiny over a knife ridge, slope and cliff, mud and sand, sea rise and fall, wave like the beach came and went, back, back, back and forth. On layers of sandstone and shale, I walk with the small dog, oblivious to scale. Coyotes yip their yip. I found an eagle feather and thought I could almost believe in God, for even I walk on water several months a year. Up high, unseen movement heard loud, rock fall echo down and recede from the coal laden ridge. The snow covered valley looks paleocene, one or two dim lights. Then three, quick-tongued primates build shelter, kindle fire, gather together, humanity on the edge of the sea. Young Venus, sharp above the western dune. To have one true friend in this life is enough. Twice last week on the ridgeline, a coyote leapt into the sky and flew off an eagle. Hmm. Well, coming back from the Cretaceous to the near present <laughs> or the unfortunately ever present. This is called Hey Betsy for Dave Hoss. When plans go awry, the stream runs ever the same over the dam of the day and real people suffer. 
and supermarkets are more super than all rise fluctuations on the shelves of the pond in the night tails slap in the dark pig bones sink a raccoon screams out belief folds back i'll vouch for that seven heights erode a golden rule and the pretty boys sing so sly and twee hey betsy welcome to your new school <laughs> hey betsy good riddance i guess we could add <laughs> Well, I talk to Neely every day, and it's, um, I mean, this, uh, who is it, uh, Berryman has a great video of him saying, life is boring. <laughs> well, life is not boring when Neely's on the phone, <laughs> and we talk every day, and he's so exciting and, and energetic, and, um, and I just love the interaction, and uh, we talk about where poems come from, and uh, he's, just in the last week or so, he's written or revisited some things he wrote uh, 50, 60 years ago. And I was thinking of um, just last week, I was thinking about I, about 30 years ago, I, I uh, was in Australia and, and spent a bunch of time in Tasmania. And uh, in 1996, there was a mass shooting in Tasmania. This is a god awful thing. And uh, <clears throat> unlike some places after that shooting the government got their shit together and and passed some uh, very stringent gun control rules that have largely prevented similar incidents unlike here anyway uh this is called port arthur 1991 it was him i know it was him and he freaked me out as his ax went down and up and down and Joan Jett and the Blackhearts played way too loud in the cab of a truck, too shiny north of the lake, sound as pain for eardrums to oscillate, for sense to make anything of the sort so far off from the norm, certain hairs arose, alarm, a wary for any possible defense I wanted out of there now and dawn and in the twilight of a normal day, a cloud covered his face in the picnic shelter five years before the murder. His ax went up and his ax went down and his eye watched his ax go up and down so hard, 35 dead. His father waded down in the pond behind the shed. I found my bike and rode away, aware of ends that do occur. Dumb luck and the one chance to escape from times that are bad. But mostly, I just ride through and wave out the window at the moon and the soon to be famous for what they only knew their plan to be, to think it out to act as if in a show, shoot from the hip, wave down a caravan, one, two, three, four, turn on the video, finish your meal and open fire. Oof. Unbelievable the crap that infects our being these days. Do I got time for a couple more minutes, Malvika, or how's it looking? You have time. You have about two more minutes. Right. I'll read moderately fast. But what we can do in the midst of, of our lives. <laughs> this is called Watching Baseball. It's got a little epigraph from a great baseball lover, Marianne Moore. The epigraph is imaginary gardens with real toads in them. Watching baseball with contempt for it, its simple contrivances, the way it's designed for another commercial break every half inning, the control freak agents, managers, and players, constant rancor at the umpires, 
the ceaseless announcers like house flies when the cows are close. All the scores from around the league, contempt for the season's length, the whole thing caught up in it. The thing like watching paint dry, say those who describe it as dull inaction of half athletes whose exploits are always about average. And yet, growing up with it, one finds between the lines in baseball something genuine. The old man and a cigar, history, strategy, symmetry, stretch and have a dog and a beer, spill your pop going for a foul, stand up and yell out loud at the damn bums and give praise to the human animal in action. Hail young bipeds performing at their peak, grown men in uniform, ready and willing to run through walls, spending the energy of any young warrior with no killing, usually no blood. Tonight, the guy pitching is the pitcher who threw a pitch behind the head of the batter at the plate six years ago. Big brew, ha ha. The bench is cleared, a punch was thrown, a couple of ejections in the booth, in the stands, in the hanky waving fans. Anticipation settles over the field where no love is lost and there could be a fight. The world is not perfect. But a 5-4-3 double play is a beautiful thing to see. The image at once held forever in the mind, conjured up at abrupt times that defy time like a humpback line drive. The pitcher goes into his windup, looks the runners back, lifts, twists, pauses on one leg, stretches back, exhales big, uncorks it once, his arm bends on the tube in slow-mo, sickeningly back, as if to snap, he throws a curve. The batter speaks with his bat, adjusts his nuts so nonchalant, spits, rubs on the tar, crosses himself up to God, wraps the straps of his gloves tight, digs in, takes a few swings, looks up, sees, the trajectory of a white ball arc out into the black night. He bangs his bat on the plate, two on, one out, top of the ninth, down a run. He takes his stance, radio dreams of kids asleep across the land. The brute grips and tenses, breathes and releases, whips his club around, grabs his woman by the hair lines one down the third base line. The third baseman, ambushed by that shot, that stalwart at the hot corner can only react. Knowing that he is, he lunges, snags, leaps to his feet, throwing and around the horn they go. Third to second to first, game over. The announcer grabs his heart, leapt out his mouth, stuffs it back down, continues to talk. The hawkers of beer fold up their carts. The drunks stumble off to other fights. A blind man in the stand stands, can almost see the old home team running off the field. So diamond green. Thanks, Malvika. Thank you, everybody. It's been a pleasure being here. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, I. I love those. I've been thinking so much about sporting metaphors. Um, thank you, Danny. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, love the way you tuned in from Lithic. Thank you, Aggie. Thank you, Seth. And of course, thank you, Neely, for bringing us all together, uh, for bringing us into this fun space of improvisation, of writing poems in the middle of the night, uh, and all of this fellowship. Um, as always, we'll share the recording of today's reading on our archives, as well as on YouTube. So it will be available in a day or two if you'd like to revisit this magical space. Uh, and please join us again tomorrow when we're joined by Marcia and Daniel Minter, co-founders of the Indigo Arts Alliance, an organization that focuses on nurturing and supporting a life in the arts uh, for folks in the African diaspora. Uh, I feel that that's an organization that's really kindred to us here at The Rail. Um, and they will be in conversation with art historian Jessamine Vitario and closing with a poetry reading by Brandon Wint. 
that will be as always at 1 p.m. right here in the Zoom. But other than that, thank you all so much. Um, I'll invite you all to turn on your microphones if you'd like to say hello to each other or goodbye on your way out or anything else you feel uh, compelled to share. Um, but this has been so incredible. Thank you so much, Neely, um, for letting us into the world. Thank you, everyone. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Good thank to see you, you Aggie. Thanks, great everyone. To meet you. Great to meet you, Seth. Yeah, yeah, good to meet you guys. That was too. great poetry, Ray. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all. I will also say uh, Kyle's Cosmographies is forthcoming from Cuneiform Press later this year. I dropped a link to the space where uh, that will be shortly. Um, so please check that out and stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kyle. Thank hey, you. Raymond. Oh, hey, how's it going? Hi, Raymond. Say hi, hi to Malika. Hi, Pong. Thank, Thank you, Seth. Hi, John. Thank you, John. <laughs>